Hello again, I'm Robert Fithin. In this video, I want to talk about some classic TV stars that have actually made albums. Yes, this is what happens when TV stars make records. We'll talk about people like Burt Reynolds, who of course later became a big movie star, uh, Don Johnson, the little redheaded kid from Different Strokes. Uh, we'll talk about Lisa Hartman. We'll talk about Lisa Welchel. We'll talk about Leonard Nimoy and maybe some others, but let's start it off with Wonder Woman! Yeah, I had to actually get into the shed and go through some boxes to find this. I hope you appreciate that. But this is not the album we're talking about. We are talking about the actress that played Wonder Woman, Linda Carter, and her 1978 album called Portrait. Uh, this is the only record she came out with for a very long time. Uh, she didn't come out with another one until like the late 2000s. So this was for a long time her only release. And as you can see, this is the coveted promo version with the uh, timing sticker on the front. And it is a white label promo. It comes with a full lyric inner sleeve, as well as this uh, little in color, or not color, but I guess it is a black and white on red uh, insert here telling you all about Linda Carter, as if you didn't know. She's been on the cover of all kinds of magazines like Photoplay and TV Guide and Us and Ladies Home Journal. There's the photo. Uh, same photo on the back cover here, uh, but it's reversed. One of them is. Uh, this is actually the cover of the UK version of this album. They decided just to call it Linda Carter and use this cover, but this is actually the cover of the American one. And this is a typical, you know, soft rock, soft disco kind of, you know, uh, light rock kind of thing from 1978. It's got all of those kind of musical elements. Uh, Linda Carter sings probably exactly how you think she would, very... Very smooth, very nice. It is a very pleasant voice. It doesn't, you know, do these big, long, you know, boisterous, you know, arias or something like that. She's just got a very pleasant voice. She doesn't overdo it. Kind of sounds a little more of like a soft rock, maybe on the country side of things a little bit there. Kind of little sounds like a little Charlene. I was, you know, I've been to Paradise, but I've never been to me type of, type of vocal on these. Uh, very pleasant songs. Um... Yeah, I mean, she does a cover of Billy Joel's She's Always a Woman to Me, but she changes the word to, to like. So she's always a woman like me. Just talking about another woman that's like her, and, you know, she takes care of herself and all that. She's got a cover of Doris Troy's Just One Look on here. She's got songs about lines that people give and lines on faces and all that. So it's just some very typical uh, soft rock on here. But the end of side one, I think, gets to what, what a lot of guys probably bought this album for, and that's the song Fantasy Man. That's where she gets a little sexy and talks about in firelight, our legs in, in, entwine. Oh, uh, draw me back and we are one. And your fingertips on my quivering lips and you tender me with your touch and all, all of this kind of stuff. It, it's the kind of thing that the guy that bought this in 1978 would be like, oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's why I bought that Linda Carter album. I'm letting you put it. Fantasy man, I'll be your fantasy man, honey. Tell you what, you keep singing like that. I'm gonna have to take it out. That's right. Sorry, I'm gonna have to do it. It's gonna make an appearance. She keeps singing words like that. Oh yeah, baby. Talk that trash, girl, talk that trash. That's, uh, yeah, Linda Carter and Fantasy Man. She's all alone, but she's not with her Fantasy Man. They're with her. So very sultry stuff from uh, Wonder Woman. She actually ends the album with one of the songs that was a promotional only single. None of these charted or anything like that. And the song is called Toto, Don't It Feel Like Paradise. This is where things start to get a little strange. The song apparently is about the dog Toto from Wizard of Oz because she keeps saying, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. So, you know, it's obviously a Wizard of Oz reference. But she's, it's this sexy, Toto, don't it feel like paradise? And who thought it could be this nice, just you and me? It's like a sexy love song to a dog. She's singing to the dog Toto and she's talking about being in paradise and it's so nice and it's so bizarre. Um, she actually sings this song uh, reportedly in an episode of Wonder Woman. I guess there's an episode of Wonder Woman where she's singing songs and this is one of them. The love song to the dog Toto. I don't know if she's got some peanut butter somewhere <laughs> trying to do that trick or what, but that is a strange way to end this album uh, that just kind of goes along as a very typical soft rock album from the 70s with the sexy woman singing, but uh, Linda Carter and Portrait from... Uh, 1978. All right, next up is Burt Reynolds. 
and his 1973 album, Ask Me What I Am. This is his only album. Now, Burt Reynolds, obviously, much more of a movie star than a TV star, but he did start off on TV, like shows like Gunsmoke and whatever. But I think, most, like most people know him as a movie star. As a matter of fact, this was probably the first movie star I ever knew about. Uh, he was definitely the first guy I ever saw movies of in an actual movie theater. Uh, when I was really a little kid, uh, I had a brother-in-law that would take, uh, you know, his wife, my sister, and me to the movies, and uh, exclusively, like, they were either Burt Reynolds or Clint Eastwood. That was it. No exceptions. It was either a Burt Reynolds movie or a Clint Eastwood movie from the time I was about four to about seven. So I saw all the Every Which Way But Loose, Any Which Way You Can, Smokey and the Bandit, probably the first movie I ever saw in the theater. I was like four years old, so... You know, I uh, barely remember seeing that in theater, but I remember I did see that, saw the sequel in theater, saw Cannonball Run, saw Hooper. Uh, and so, yeah, it was all about the Burt Reynolds movie. So he was like the big guy on the big screen. And um, I think I saw this back in the 90s and was like, wow, Burt Reynolds has an album. Got to get that, you know, just to, just to have it, you know, one of those things. And never played it until like uh, this week. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's pretty much what I expected. And uh, the artwork here, this is from 1973 on Mercury Records. So it's very similar to Rod Stewart's Every Picture Tells a Story, in that you have to get the version that still has the uh, poster intact of Burt Reynolds on the back. It's perforated, so it easily comes out two-sided, just like the Rod Stewart one. And uh, yeah, so it has that uh, on the back, and you can easily take that off and hang it on the wall. Uh, this person did not do that, uh, but yeah, it's a uh, it's a very talk singy kind of record. He he knows he can't sing, so he doesn't try to push it. A lot of it is uh, you know just kind of this real breathy. You know, this is for people. This is an album for people who thought Burt Reynolds was sexy, and uh, yeah, this was back when he was making more like sexy R rated. Uh, you know, uh, he's a tough guy. You know, this was around the time of Deliverance and uh, Seamus and White Lightning and The Man Who Loved Cat Dancing and all those movies, yes, sexy Burt Reynolds. And it starts off with this childhood 1949 song where he's reminiscing in this breathy, talky voice about all the different... He's like, it's like a list of things from his childhood. Then you get, which I don't get why this is the second song because it really already throws the album completely off, this song about this old man that the kids in town, uh, this slow old man... The kids in town get a bunch of money together and dare him to get on this motorcycle and he gets on the motorcycle and he takes off on it and jumps over a thing and they didn't realize that he was the motorcycle champion of 1932 through 1936 and well, he was on that motorcycle. He was just going to... He's got this really hokey southern, you know... Ex I think he was born in Michigan, but uh, I think he grew up in Florida maybe, so he's got, you know... But he's got this whole hokey thing going on and that's a really weird song to be number two because it goes right back into the sexy breathy songs and he doesn't try to push his voice like i said a lot of them are are talky kind of songs with this just this oh yeah oh just what i need as a lover tonight and you know that kind of thing he's got this song on there where he tries to sing a little bit more he tries to put a little more notes into the into the vocals uh with very not great results called she's taken a, a a gentle lover is the name of the song which is a great name for us she's taken a gentle lover she's tired of the hard stuff man she's taken an exit off of pound town she's tired of making love and then she can't walk up a flight of steps the next day so she's taken a gentle lover now actually it doesn't say anything like that but it, you get the point um yeah results are not great when he tries to sing he, he's got a song on here called room for a boy never used about how he just really wants a son so the son can have all these things that little boys have, like, you know, we dress up like a cowboy and a tin star and he's got a tree house with secrets in it and whatever. But the way that Burt Reynolds is, it's a kind of a sad song because he really wants a son and, you know, but the way he's singing all these songs in this sexy, breathy voice and this loungy kind of, it sounds creepy as hell. So... It's a, it's a mixed record, but it's a cheap record. You can get this for like $5, Burt Reynolds fans. And then you can have Burt Reynolds' only album, Ask Me What I Am. I wonder if in an interview he's ever like had somebody sit down and see it, be like, yeah, so what are you? Ask me what I am. Yeah, Burt Reynolds. His uh, only album from 1973. Have had it in the collection for decades. Finally gave it a listen. 
Up next is an actor that got his start in movies, but then became a big TV star, sort of the opposite of Burt Reynolds, and that is Don Johnson, that most people remember from the 80s TV show Miami Vice. And uh, so that was at the peak of its popularity around 85, 86, and that's when this album from Don Johnson came out called Heartbeat. And uh, yeah, as, uh, I was familiar with the song Heartbeat. It was all over MTV. It was all over the radio. Heartbeat, I'm looking for a heartbeat. It sounds about like, you know, it's not, it's, it's not, that's an identical vocal, of course. And uh, so, yeah, big hit. Uh, I think it went to like, number five on the charts. The album went gold. So this is like a legitimate, you know, pop hit album from Don Johnson. He only put out a couple. The other one, I don't know anything about. It came out in like 89, but this was the big one. Uh, it was accompanied by a full-length uh, video that was on video cassette, you know, like an hour-long movie or something like that with these big production values. They did the same thing with Mick Jagger when She's the Boss came out. They had a big, uh, it was CBS Fox video, same company, had a big long hour video with him and Ray Don Chong was in it and a few other big people and they had all these big production values and it's called Running Out of Luck. And it was like a long form music video that had, you know, all the songs from the album. Same thing here with this uh, Don Johnson project. The thing about this is, is it is just serviceable music. It starts off really kind of loud. You're thinking, wow, you know, these big 80s drums, this big guitar. And then the first thing you hear, you know, this is the song Heartbeat. The single starts off. And then the first thing you hear after that is the lyrics. And you get, uh, I don't care what you say. You give it away. Your money don't mean much to me. Well, I'm out on my own. Gonna go it all alone now, because that's the way it's gotta be. Everybody tells me how. I can beat the odds somehow. Well, I'm standing by the fire. I can't feel the heat. It's just like 25 cliches a minute. I mean, it's just one after the other. John Bon Jovi would look at this and go, wow, man. Nice job. That's a lot of cliches, man. That's a lot of cliches. And uh, so you just have this uh, arena of cliches thrown together for this song. It's serviceable. It sounds like an 80s song. It sounds like something, you know, that would be like a top 15 hit. I don't know about number five, but, you know, uh, it's just kind of, you know, okay. It's the kind of thing, you know how not everybody is a music fan. You know, I'm, I'm, I was, I've said this before. I was like a weird little kid. I, I was way into music from like age two. I don't know why. It's just some, I was just drawn to records and tapes from an extremely young age and just always have been way into music. Uh, you know, a lot of us that watching these videos have been like probably more into music than the average person. And that's fine. There are people that are not into music. That's great. But everybody feels like they need to listen to music, either just on the, in the car, on the way to work or whatever. They got their little music collection of a few CDs or whatever. Everybody feels like they have to have it. Like, I'm not into wine. But there are a lot of wine connoisseurs. But I don't feel like I have to have bottles of wine. I'm not into wine. But music's not like that. So this is the kind of thing where people who aren't into music would listen to this and do this. It's, it's that kind of music. It's this. You know those people. You probably got family members like that. Maybe you got distant friends like that or coworkers. They hear music they like and this is what they do. Yeah, it's good. I like this. If it's funky music, if it's more like R&B music, they do this. I'm not sure what the mouth thing is or the head bobbing, but that's what these people do. It's, it's this or it's this. It, it's the kind of thing like an executive walks into the studio and listens and he, he's not a music fan. He's just a corporate executive. He'll start doing this. Yeah. That's this music. That's what this is. The thing that says this, the thing that's kind of like weird about this or almost kind of like unsettling is that Don Johnson, because he's a big star, TV star, can just decide that he's going to make an album and he's automatically going to have all uh, on a major label, Epic Records, it's going to get all this promotion, all this radio play. He's going to have people on this album like not only Bonnie Raitt, but Ron Wood. Is, is plays on this album. Stevie Ray Vaughan plays on two tracks. One of them also Dickie Betts plays on. It's called Love Roulette. How good can a song be called Love Roulette? 
not very good, but it's got Stevie Ray Vaughan and Dickie Betts on it. He's got a song that features Willie Nelson and Willie Nelson's longtime harmonica player, Mickey Raphael. The song is called um, Star Tonight. It's just this really kind of weak, it's just an ordinary song. It's not weak, it's not great, it's just there. It's about an actress who plays like she's happy in the movie or the show she's in or whatever, but she's really sad. It doesn't go into any detail. It's very just kind of there. Written by Bob Seger. So obviously a throwaway track, but nonetheless, he's got a Bob Seger song on here. He's got a Tom Petty song on here called Lost in Your Eyes. Again, a cliche title, probably not a great song, probably something Tom Petty just tossed off after a joint, you know, smoked a joint, wrote a song, threw it away, and somehow it landed in the Epic Records production <laughs> box, and, and now Don Johnson's doing it on a record. But the point is, he's got all of these people involved in this album, and you really can't tell that any of these people are involved. You don't hear that and go, wow, that's Dickie Betts. It's just like, it's just all wasted talent, basically. But yeah, the songs are just kind of pedestrian. They're serviceable 80s tracks filled with cliches. Don Johnson does like an okay job as a singer. He's not like really blowing his voice out there and really, wow, Don Johnson can sing. It's kind of like what you'd expect to hear on like karaoke night or something like that. But it's just kind of there. Uh, Don Johnson, Heartbeat. Uh, now I've finally heard the uh, whole album. I'd only been familiar with the uh, single to begin with that played over and over. Oh, beat, I'm looking for a heartbeat. I was familiar with that. Now I've heard the entire album. Second track starts I got the, with the smoky, s sexy 80s saxophone. So you got that in there. You got some like, you know, kind of like music in there. Mostly it's just this 80s synths, you know, squealing guitar solo, big 80s drum sound. Um, not horrible, not great. It's probably exactly what you would think it would be. Now it's time to uh, talk about Meet the Brady Bunch. Now this is the Brady Bunch's second album called Meet the Brady Bunch. So they're kind of like the Beatles in the fact that their second album is Meet the Meet the Beatles. Well, their second American album, anyway. Uh, their first one was not called Introducing the Brady Bunch. It was actually some sort of Christmas album. So now we can meet the Brady Bunch properly. And uh, brace yourself. This is going to come as a shock, but this is not a very good album at all. I know. I know we had high expectations for the Brady Bunch album. Uh, this is different from the other albums because this is actually credited to uh, the characters instead of, you know, like this is not like the Linda Carter album or the Don Johnson album or something. So uh, it does feature their photos on the back here, and uh, but it is the Brady Bunch. And um, yeah, not, not good. The whole album is just everybody singing together. I mean, there's very few times somebody takes a solo. It, if it is, it's like one line in a song. Uh, some remakes on here, they do I'm, Baby I'm a Want You from Bread, which makes Bread's version sound like heavy metal or something like that. They do Bad Fingers day after day. Don't do Bad Finger if you're the Brady Bunch. Don't do that. Mm, no, that's not going to work. Very first song is ridiculous. It's, uh, you know, you and I will always be friends. We'll always be friends. Yeah, we'll always be friends. You and I will always be friends. We'll always be friends. Yeah, we'll always... I mean, that's... When they do their own stuff, that's the kind of lyrics that are, are given to them. Um, but yeah, um, this has the song Time for Change on it. The one where, if you remember the episode, you've watched the Brady Bunch, remember the episode, that's the one where Peter is going through puberty and his voice cracks and, you know, you get the comedy. There's not, That's not even on. The, the, the voice crack is not on here. This is just sung straight through. Again, with everybody singing at the same time, you can't really tell that it's the Brady Bunch. It just sounds like a bunch of children singing in this very milk toast kind of just it's terrible um there's no comedy here there's no fun here the brady bunch should be fun right it should be kitschy it should be why isn't alice you know why doesn't alice have a song on here talking about sam the butcher man why isn't there there could be like an instrumental track here and, and it's credited to like jan's boyfriend uh george glass that would be fun there, there could be funny fun stuff on here that references the show but there's not. It's just them singing a bunch of uh, songs very, very blandly. They do American Pie on here, which I'm sure that song is popular enough to where you know American Pie by Don McLean. It's like an eight and a half minute song, right? Well, theirs is like three minutes. And so they cut a bunch of the lyrics out. 
And they start in the middle of the song. So literally the first, they don't even sing the part about Bye Bye Miss American Pie yet. The very first thing they sing is Helter Skelter in the Summer Squelter. Um, I thought that was an odd choice to make the Brady Bunch sing Helter Skelter as the first uh, thing in American Pie. But you do get to hear them sing about, you know, their their fists were clenched in uh, fists of rage, uh, uh, you know, uh, hands were clenched in fists of rage and Satan's spell and all that. Yeah, that's all a part of their version of American Pie, which is just bizarre the way they sing it. Um, but yeah, I'm assuming this really is them since it's credited on Wikipedia to the actual actors, but it could be anybody singing this. That's the thing. This is a very generic sounding album. Uh, really could have been some fun in here, could have been some Brady Bunch references, but uh, no, it's just really weak, just treacly singing throughout with this chorus of children and uh, it, very nondescript and just it, you're on board with it like a minute and a half in and the whole thing is just the same all the way through. So yeah, I, I'm sorry, I cannot recommend Meet the Brady Bunch. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, that, you know, when do we get to the William Shatner albums? Well, I don't have those, actually. The William Shatner albums have actually become somewhat collectible. Uh, they're, they're kind of hard to find uh, in the last uh, couple of decades, so I don't have those. Plus, those have been talked about quite a bit. They're, they're not obscure. You know, everybody's doing reviews of those a few years ago, and William Shatner doing the 60s songs in his particular uh, speaking style. Hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me you know, or whatever. I don't have that, but I do have The Touch of Leonard Nimoy. Uh, this came out in 1969 on Dot Records. Uh, I'm not sure how many albums he has, but I have this one. And uh, it's basically like a, a singer-songwriter soft rock type of 1969 sound. Uh, he, you know, ha kind of has a Gordon Lightfoot kind of style, <laughs> or the early days of Gordon Lightfoot. And uh, his voice is not confident, it's not strong. He, he kind of sings like this a lot, like he's kind of, you know, not quite sure of his vocal ability, and they probably had to turn the mics way up. You know, so it's kind of like that. It, it's basically just a lot of uh, pedestrian stuff on here, and uh, I don't think he does any, um, any real uh, big remakes, except for uh, I Just Can't Help Believing is uh, on here, and he does a really kind of weak, job with that but you gotta love Leonard Nimoy but I can't really say anything bad about Leonard Nimoy they do have his ear prominently featured here which you know shows you that he's an actual human he's not a Vulcan on the cover of the album uh but yeah the, 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 it's going along here it's kind of like all right this really isn't anything to really to speak of and then you get side two and uh, then he starts the talking, similar to the way William Shatner, not the way William Shatner talks, but the way that, you know, it's a talking more of a, a, a you know, instead of singing with this song called Nature Boy. And, uh, you know, there was a boy. He was a strange and enchanted boy who went far away. It's like, wh where did this come from? And then to follow that up with a song called Contact, where things get really spacey, and he's all about, we're, we're, we're about to make contact. We're locked in orbit, uh, polarization in a magnetic storm. And, you know, th then he says something like, the past is a thing of the past. It's like, oh, okay, is that like time will tell the test of time, like Van Halen? Uh, but yet the past is a thing of the past. Separation is closing fast, closing fast closing fast permission granted to land or something like that it's very spacey it's exactly what you came here for from the guy from star trek and this like i said this came out in 1969 I, i'm not a big star trek fan but from what i understand star trek wasn't really that popular when it was first on it was only on for like two seasons or whatever so this would have come out like during the first run of star trek right 1969 so, um, yeah, he's all about the contact there. And then that song ends, and you're like, wow, this, okay, this is, this is what I was more wanting from Leonard N Nimoy. And then the, and I, we go right back to the singer-songwriter. Oh, man, I would love to be, but that's not me. You know, and all that kind of stuff. So um, we're right back to it. The Touch of Leonard Nimoy from 1969. All right, we're now up to the CD era. And the band is called Bad for Good, and this is their uh, release called Refugee from 1992. It features Danny Cooksey on vocals. Now, that is not really a household name, but if you grew up watching the TV show Different Strokes, you might recognize him. You know how when 
uh, TV shows that featured cute little kids on them. They were on for several seasons, so the little kids would start getting older, and they'd have to bring in a new kid, usually one with red hair later on in the later seasons. Danny Cooksey was the little red-headed kid that they brought in later uh, for the different strokes, and he was uh, named Sam, and he was Arnold's uh, little friend. Yeah, so that's Danny. Now, do you recognize him now? Even if you didn't watch Different Strokes, he was in like one episode of a bunch of other shows like The Dukes of Hazard. He was in one of those. He was in one of the episodes for like Riptide and Mr. Belvedere and Growing Pains. He was in the Dolly Parton Christmas movie, A Smoky Mountain Christmas as well. Uh, he was also later on as a teenager in the movie Terminator 2. He was the friend of uh, Edward Furlong, uh, the John Connor character there. He, yes, that was him. Uh, one of the only movies he was in. Yes, this is a laser disc. We're all about the 90s right now. <laughs> Look at that gatefold laser disc. This is actually pretty. I kept this because I like the uh, the style of the artwork so much. But yes, a laser disc of uh, Terminator 2. If you've never seen laser disc, that's that's what they look like. Just like an LP uh, jacket there. But anyway, Bad for Good is what we're talking about. The band. And like I said, this is 1992, and the issue with this is it sounds more like 1988 or something like that. They were a little past the, the time of this sound. They were this hard rock band made up of, like, teenagers. I mean, like, 16-year-olds, 14-year-olds. The guitarist is crazy. His name is Thomas McRocklin, not his real last name. Uh, Thomas McRocklin, he, now, I don't have any confirmation on this. But uh, reportedly, he is such a guitar virtuoso from a very young age that he opened for Ozzy Osbourne when he was eight years old. He's from the UK. Um, he, uh, you know, is just this child prodigy guitar player who really has some serious guitar skills on this CD. Uh, Steve Vai actually kind of took him under his wing. And, uh, you know, he's in a couple of Steve Vai videos. Uh, he's the kid, of course. And then Steve Vai, like, I guess, got this group assembled, produced this album, wrote the songs on it, which, lyrics of this, is the, like, the, that's where it starts to go south. But yeah, Steve Vai, um, behind this whole thing, and this Thomas McRocklin guy was just a guitar genius as a little kid, and he's just wailing on this album. In the typical Steve Vai, like, Eddie Van Halen type, but, you know, the, the, the tapping and stuff like that, he's all about this kind of late 80s sound, but again... It's the grunge era here. That's why this probably didn't do that well. Uh, another kid, Brooks uh, Weckerman, which is a great last name, uh, is on the drums. He now drums for Avenged Sevenfold. Uh, so you got guys that went on to, uh, here they are, the, the guys that went on to uh, do, you know, great things later on in life. Danny Cooksey, I'm not sure what happened to him after Terminator 2. He's probably still out there doing like I don't know, autograph signings or something for Terminator 2 festivals or something like that, or maybe different strokes reunions or something. But uh, yeah, um, so yeah, this album opens with a Phil Linet uh, from his uh, non-Thin Lizzy days uh, called 19, which no one in this band is yet 19, so they're looking to the future. But just a lot of screaming vocals, a lot of attitude, the squealing guitars, the just, you, you got like the, the double uh, kick uh, drumming going on, especially in the song Tire Kicking, which is basically just this really fast uh, instrumental, so you just want to crank this up and rock out like it's 1987. Again, the problem is it's 1992. That's If you weren't around in those days, 1992 and 1987 are completely different rock era. So these guys came along a little too late, and it's kind of hard to be taken seriously when you're, you know, 14 years old, no matter how great you played. These guys, when this album was out, which was, by the way, this came out only a year after uh, Terminator 2. But um, so, yeah, th this, when this was out, they were touring with Damn Yankees opening for them. So kind of, you know, a little bit of a similar vein there. They probably blew Damn Yankees off stage, actually. But the bad thing is the lyrics. They just the terrible, tropey kind of rock lyrics. There's a, another song on here called Bangin' Time Again, which I think was one of the singles uh, where he's like, that bitch is so hot. Yeah, she's got me banging my head again. Ah! You know, it's just way over the top, and I, I don't need a 14-year-old talking about that bitch is so hot. I mean, come, get, give us, get, give it, give us a break. And you can't even blame the kids, because like I said, they were written by Steve Vai. Uh, there they are again. And you open up the book, and this is, wow, this is what you see. This is, you get lyrics. Um, no, this, that's not going to work for me. 
Uh, I don't need to see a bunch of, uh, I would assume by the looks of them, uh, prepubescent boys with no shirts on and all with the same like long hair like that. That's part of and the, that. I don't even want to show that anymore. Um, I don't know what that was all about, but we don't need that. But um, yeah, and I don't know who the kid is on the front here either on the uh, cover artwork there. That's a, another random kid with no shirt on uh, looking more like a, a eight year old. But I don't know what's going on with this artwork, but uh, bad for good. Um, again, crank it up. Uh, very impressive considering their ages. Not something that is going to be, you know, something that's going to go down in the Hall of Fame. But these guys, I mean, they just had the one album. And I think if they would have been given a little more, a little better material to work with, maybe a second chance, they could have actually um, done something. Maybe a different name than that stupid bad for good. I mean, again, that's like 80s. That's not 90s. That's that's terrible, that name. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, it's a, it's a decent listen until you get to the last track um, where, uh, uh, Mr. Cooksey starts rapping. It's like a rap metal. We definitely did not need to end on that. They could have just done 12 tracks. The CD would have been fine with that length. But, um, yeah, I, I don't think they were taken too seriously and it's too bad because a lot of talented uh, musicians in that, obviously, especially for their ages. But yeah, Danny Cooksey, uh, Sam from Different Strokes, went on to be in a hard rock band that was, uh, out of time in 1992. Next up is Bruce Willis and the Return of Bruno. Now, similar to the Don Johnson album, there was a whole long form video that went with this. This one aired on HBO as a special. I have not seen it. I don't want to see it. I don't care. And I never heard this album until this week. Now, I was familiar with the single Respect Yourself. Yes, a cover of the Staple Singers, and that was on MTV, and that was on the radio. My God, uh, I've, now heard, I've now heard this album, and it is just as awful as the single. It's as bad as I thought it would be. It is not a crown in the Bruce Willis jewel hat, jewel in the crown, whatever. I can't even talk. I, I hate this album so much. Um, this came out in early, like, like I think in like January of 87. So this is before he had any starring roles in movies. He was a TV star. That's why he's part of this video. He was in the TV show Moonlighting with Sybil Shepard. Uh, so this is way before like Die Hard or Hudson Hawk or even before Blind Date. Um, this is one of those typical way, way watered down R&B soul projects when the actor gets involved, usually a white actor with, you know, very limited vocal range and they're going to be all soulful because they're privileged and they're comedian and so they get to be the Blues Brothers. This is the Blues Brothers all over again and I cannot stand... Those Blues Brothers, I hate the Blues Brothers records. Yes, I know you love the Blues Brothers records. That's you, I'm me. I cannot stand those Blues Brothers records. The movie was fine, it was funny, it had funny parts. The records, you can keep them. And similar to the Blues Brothers, you've got people like Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles, Booker T, people like that. In the Blues Brothers project, they were at a really low point in their careers. They had to make some money, this is how they did it, so they become part of a comedy act. Same thing here, you've got Booker T again, whose talent is completely indistinguishable. He's on these 80s keyboards. If you're, look, if you're listening for like Time is Tight or, or Hip Hugger or Green Onions or something like that, you're not going to find it on this album, I'll tell you that. You've got the Pointer Sisters. You've got uh, Jeff Steele from Poco. You've got the Temptations. You've got Jeff Lorber. I don't know that much about him, but all these people's talent are completely wasted being involved in this ridiculous project. Um, terrible. I mean, this is so bad it actually pisses me off. This is the kind of album that's that's beyond just... Because, you know, a lot of these these celebrity albums are vanity projects, and they can have some humor involved, or even, even if it's unintentional humor. You know, some of it's kind of funny to listen to it, like, oh my god. This is not that. This is terrible, and it's it, it's actually upsetting. It's so... Because it, it, I can't stand when people do this to friggin' great soul music and R&B music and funk music and whatever. I can't stand when they water it down and make it sound like this friggin' three o'clock in the afternoon Vegas act. And that's exactly what this is with the late eighties production, with the horns, with the keyboards, with the, the syncopated pedestrian drumming, everything about this is awful. And for those who were not around in the eighties, who, who see like eighties stuff and go, man, the eighties must've been killer. Oh my God, to be a teenager in the eighties, that must've been so cool. And yes, a lot of it was really cool, but then listen to stuff like this and you'll see that it wasn't all awesome. There were, there was shit like this. And the bad thing, the really upsetting thing is 
This isn't like some off the scene kind of Linda Carter album. This is this thing went gold. This thing went to number 14 on the US album charts and number four on the UK album charts. Gold in both places. UK, what? If anybody's watching this for the UK, I've got a question. What? This thing went platinum in Canada. What? This is awful. Oh my God, he does these covers like under the boardwalk, which is just kind of there. I mean, John Cougar does a better version. Bette Midler does a better version of under the boardwalk, for God's sakes. He's got, he does uh, Secret Agent Man, where all of a sudden he's got James Bond shit going on in the middle of this album. Respect Yourself was the single, like I said, it has June Pointer on the, like a backup vocal, and it's way backup. She's buried in the mix. Her talents are absolutely not even distinguishable. They're not even, they're totally wasted. Just awful. Just awful. And I'm a, I am liked Bruce Willis in movies. I like the Die Hard movies. I, I have Blind Date on DVD, for God's sakes. If I would have heard this back in the 80s, I probably would never even have seen Die Hard. This is so bad. But uh, yeah, the return of Bruno on Motown Records. My God, it just keeps getting worse. Motown put this out. What? So now I've got three questions. What? What? And what? For the UK, Canada, and Motown. What? Awful. I was talking about in the Don Johnson video how that this is the audience for that, the people that do this. And then I talked about, this is, this is, the audience for this are the people who hear music like this and go like this. Yeah, I dig it. It's cool. It's cool. They make that thing with their mouth and then they bob their head. That, that's what this is for. So it's, it's just sad. That's it. That's, there's no, there's nothing fun here. There's nothing to, to laugh at. It's, it's just sad and upsetting. And that's it. All right, so here's another album that uh, it's more of the characters from the TV show doing the uh, album as opposed to the uh, actor branching out with a music career. This is Lenny and Squiggy present Lenny and the Squig Tones from 1979. Lenny and Squiggy are characters from Laverne and Shirley, a show that I never really was into. My family really didn't watch it that much. The ones that we did see, I didn't really, I didn't think they were that funny or whatever, so I was not into these characters. And this album is a continuation of that uh, 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 feeling. Uh, I, yeah, it's not funny. It's supposed to be funny. Uh, it's supposed to be a live album recorded at the Roxy. I'm not sure how much of this actually is live. Didn't really delve that much into it. But for those who don't know, Lenny and Squiggy are two actors. This one, I think that's pretty much all he did was play Squiggy. Uh, his name is David Lander. He has since passed away. And this guy is Michael McKeon from, this is Spinal Tap. This is, uh, you know, so he's, he's had fake musical uh, personalities before this is Spinal Tap even came along. And if that's not enough, Christopher Guest is also on this album, calling himself Nigel Tufnell. There he is here on the, uh, there he is on the uh, inner sleeve right there with the uh, sunburst guitar. And so, yeah, you get a uh, nice inner sleeve here. Nice packaging poster even. You get a poster of... Uh, Lenny and Squiggy. <laughs> so a lot went into this uh, for being uh, uh, kind of as lame as it is. Uh, like I said, these are these are guys that are, their characters were like 50s uh, greaser types, like uh, refugees from Sha Na Na or something like that. But uh, yeah, it, it's just kind of dumb. I mean, it's typical like 1970s uh, comedy album type stuff where it's like... They think they're real funny. Apparently, the audience thinks it's funny. Uh, it's just really not that funny. One of the first jokes is, you know, hey, we're Lenny and the Squig Tones. I'm Lenny. And the other guy's like, and I'm the Squig Tones. And then they repeat that joke again. And then they do it again at the end of the album three times for that unfunny joke. They talk about different things like, uh, I don't know, this guy's a Lutheran and he doesn't know what a Lutheran is or what the Lutheran church is and who funded it. Oh, a guy named Luther Burbank. Ah. So if you're expecting the brilliant satire of This is Spinal Tap, you will uh, absolutely not find it here. So they do a bunch of, um, basically, it's like the 50s rockabilly doo-wop type songs. Uh, they're kind of supposed to be funny. The first one is about, uh, I think there's one about, uh, you know, that they wrote for a horror movie that never got made because the producer ran off to somewhere, Barbados or something with the money, and it's... Uh, 
you know, the, the creature without a head, um, you know, the king of the cars is another one, uh, sister-in-law, uh, if I'd only listened to mama, love is a terrible thing, there's a big long segment about how when women get sad, uh, they cry, when men get sad, they throw up, and oh, I saw Gone with the Wind, and it was really gut-wrenching, and I threw up several, t- and just, yeah, there's a song in here about Lenny's wedding night or Squiggy's wedding night or something, and Lenny isn't in the song. And why is it not? Why am I not in the song? I'm your best friend. You got Boney Maroney and uh, Miss Molly and all these 50s and 60s song characters, and the Duke of Earl shows up. But why am I not in your wedding song? Oh, you're in the. Yeah, it's. I mean, I guess at least you get a, a free poster. All right, so we're just about to wrap this up. Just a couple more here like this one, all because of you from Lisa Welchell from The Facts of Life. And I've actually talked about this album before, so I'm kind of repeating myself on this one. I don't usually like to repeat album reviews, uh, but uh, in a video uh, about bad album covers, I think, which I guess this isn't that bad of an album cover, it's just a bad album. Uh, But I've talked about this before, so this one will be kind of brief. But uh, yeah, this is her religious album from 1984, so she would have been about 20 years old when she came out with this. This was the high point of The Facts of Life, which, by the way, I have the complete series of on DVD. (laughs) Every episode of The Facts of Life here, including when they left the school and opened up the bakery or whatever that was, yes, they're all contained. Uh, This is, what, like nine seasons or something like that? But, uh, yeah, so... The Facts of Life. It sits behind me back on that thing. It's the one that looks like this on the spine. It's in pretty much all the videos. You just didn't know what it was. Uh, but yeah, Lisa Welchell, her inspirational album, was nominated for a Grammy in 1984 for Best Inspirational Album. I don't know what this inspired. It inspired me to uh, remove it from the turntable as soon as I could. Uh, but yeah, you know how I feel about the Grammys, if you've seen my other videos. Uh, not a fan of the Grammys at all. Never have been. Uh, the 84 Grammys were okay, I guess, when I was like, you know, 11 years old. But, um, so yeah, this, uh, I, again, I've talked about it before. I'm not going to go way into it. I just, again, with the obedience song, you just obey, just obey your obedience. will. Be, you know, you're talking about obedience over this synthy kind of, the whole album is like 80s synth pop. So you've got this kind of robotic music talking about obedience, just very odd. How deep, how wide? Got to mention that one again. How deep, how wide is your love? It's, it's you know, you, we love the religious albums with the double entendres, and that's the song on here that fits that bill, you know. It's too wide and too long to measure or something like that. She just gets carried away uh, with that. Most of the songs on here are asking, you would, you know, there's, I guess they're about God. They're asking God for things, usually to give me shelter or protect me. Like, there's just people coming after Lisa Welchell, or, or she's just living in a really violent area, or, and she constantly needs to be saved, or sheltered, or protected, and that's the that's a theme in a lot of these songs, and she's always asking for things. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, and, and a lot of it is kind of blurring the lines between, is she talking about, like, a, like Jesus, or is she talking about, like, a guy in her life? Because if these are like relationship songs, she's in very toxic relationships in here, always having to be sheltered and, and, and guided, and I'm going to show you my obedience and, and all this kind of stuff. And it's just not, you know, the thing about this is, is I wanted to mention this one again. You know, she is a TV star, so it fits this video. But she's kind of back in the news again. She's a little newsworthy these days because apparently she's... Uh, upset the other Facts of Life uh, actresses because they were all set to get back together and do another show. Not, not, a, not a talk show where they all come on and talk about the Facts of Life. They've done that several times. But actually get together as their characters and, and do a, a reboot of the Facts of Life. Um, I guess the producer, Norman Lear, was greenlighting this. And Lisa Welchell is the one that uh, held the whole thing up with her greediness, reportedly. Mindy Cohn went as far as on some podcast, she's the one that played Natalie, went as far as on a podcast to call her a greedy bitch and said that the friendship was over, uh, the facts of life, any kind of reunion thing, that's not going to happen now, and uh, everybody is blaming Blair. So, lyric sheet with this, by the way. But, so yeah, I thought it was, it was you know, she's back in the news, so I thought I would uh, revisit the... Lisa Welchell album, an album I don't want to ever play again.
All right, so the last one here is, uh, well, you know, people generally, I found out, don't watch the very ends of my videos anyway, so I figured I'd put this one on last. This is Lisa Hartman, and uh, from 1982, her album Letter Rock. Just one word, Letter Rock. Letter Rock. Uh, this is what the cover originally looked like uh, in 1982, and then it was re-released uh, just the same year with this cover. They basically just switched the back and front covers, and now we've got uh, titties in a truck, is what it's called now. Actually, that's not what it's called, but uh, yeah, she's standing here in a, uh, you know, a negligee in front of an old truck. <laughs> I think they thought, well, man, you know what, this didn't sell any. Oh, let's make this the cover, and we'll just call it Lisa Hartman and forget about the weird letter rock uh, name. But either way, same album. Um, and, you know, there's really not a lot to say about it. It's, it's competent. It's the typical early 80s kind of pop rock. Her vocals sound like she's kind of going in a, or attempting to go in a Pat Benatar direction on some of the songs with the guy, that kind of growl, that rock, rock. Uh, I'm not saying she sounds like Pat Benatar. I'm saying that she, it sounds as though she's attempting to go in a Pat Benatar style direction. Of course, Lisa Hartman, star of Knott's Landing when this was out. She was all over TV. Uh, she was in a few movies as well. This would be the one from 81 that came out the year before. Wes Craven's uh, Deadly Blessing. Great movie. Uh, about the... I think they were Amish or whatever, and she's got, an, she got a very interesting role in this movie. Uh, but yeah, she was the one that brought the eggs over. Very uh, interesting movie. If you'd like to see me actually review this movie, Deadly Blessing... Uh, you can watch my uh, early 80s horror review video from uh, a little less than a year ago around October. I actually do a review of this movie with uh, scenes in there, so you can check that out. Uh, but yeah, she was in Knott's Landing. That's what she was mostly known for from this part. She later uh, married Clint Black. It's interesting that this is on RCA, and he, of course, had a big career on RCA. And then they would actually later team up for a duet. I don't remember what the name of it was called. Uh, they had a duet. They had a hit song, country song, that was a duet. What If I Told You or something like that? What If I Said? No, that's Steve Warner. I don't know. Anyway. Um, Hiding From Love is the, the first song on here, co-written co -written by Brian Adams and uh, Jim Valance, his writing partner for a lot of hits. So she's got some, you know, Brian Adams input. She's got a song on here written by Rick Springfield called Hide In My, or Hole In My Heart, or Hide In My Heart, or something like that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's just you know, bopping along, kind of pop rock, early 80s kind of stuff. Some of the stuff is somewhat catchy. Uh, it might have actually been a m couple of mid-level hits on here if it would have been given the right promotion, but it wasn't, and it just kind of faded into history. She's actually got like four albums. She had a couple before this came out in the late 70s. She had one from the mid-80s too, so she's had a few. None of them did anything, and like I said, there's really not a lot to say, except for the cover. That's, that's quite the cover from uh, Lisa Hartman. So that's going to wrap it up. TV stars that made records. Of course, there were many, many more. And when you get into like later people, there's many, many more and movie stars and all of that. But these are just kind of the ones I had. And the couple like the, uh, the Bruce Willis and the uh, Don Johnson that I've always wanted to hear because I had to hear those singles over and over again when they were hits so that, that I just wanted to concentrate on just a few so uh which were your favorites have you heard any of these albums do you you know let me know in the comments uh what you thought of some of these did some of them just blow you away or were they all just kind of like yeah well, that's that's just kind of that's just kind of there I'm Robert Fitton thank you so much for watching and uh, hopefully I will uh talk to you again soon